Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life.
Matthew 9, 14 through 17. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn well he is with them the time will come then when the bridegroom will be taken from them then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away and from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into the wineskins, and both are preserved. So welcome to Storyteller, a new series we're starting here at Triumph that's going to carry us through the rest of uh, this ministry year, coming up into the summertime, where we again spend time listening to the message of Jesus. So our vision statement here at Triumph is to see the life and the message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and the cities in which God has placed us, hearts, homes, and cities. So this past year, we've been spending a lot of time in the message of Jesus. The fall, we spent our time in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, where we got a chance to listen and learn about kingdom living and this countercultural life that the kingdom of God really is compared to what we live around. And now we're going to look at the parables, the stories that Jesus told that help us understand the kingdom of God and ultimately help us understand him. Now, if, you're, if you've been around Christianity and the Jesus thing for a while, you're going to be comfortable and familiar with the word parable and, and, and what that is, but maybe you're a little bit newer towards it. We don't talk about parables really outside of the church. There are other names for stories within, within literature, and parables often not one of them. And the reason is parables are a very unique niche to, to Jesus and his teaching because what a parable is, as it's been described, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And what that really kind of looks like is Jesus taking everyday things and using those everyday things uh, from around our lives to help us understand more about the kingdom of God, to help us understand more about Jesus himself, to understand what life in the kingdom looks like. And the reason Jesus would use everyday items is they are things that we can understand. We can get our head around uh, these things because we use these items every single day. And so they become very practical for us because we can fully understand them. And how it's kind of like here is what it's kind of like here, right? So, So he uses these items that are every day that we can understand. Except maybe in our text today. All right, so, so as you've already heard that read, there's a couple things that they don't quite line up with us today. They certainly would have when Jesus presented it uh, and told the stories. But today, there's a little bit of a disconnect. So before we really kind of dive in, maybe a little context to help us understand our text for today, okay? So really, there's three things that Jesus covers in this. The first is a wedding. The second is this garments. And then the third is the wineskins, now, the first is the, is, the, is the weddings. Weddings today look so different than weddings did back when Jesus was walking the earth, when you look back into first century Palestine. Like, the weddings looked completely different. Weddings today are a day event. And really, for most of us, weddings are a few hours of an event. 
right? Like if you're in the wedding party, you're going to spend some time getting ready. You're going to have a big full day rehearsal the night before, things like that. But for those of us that attend weddings and we just get the invitation and we go, a wedding is a few hours. You've got the wedding ceremony, you've got a reception, have a little bit of fun, head home. Well, in first century Palestine, when, when, when this would have been happening, a wedding would be happening, it's a week-long celebration. Because the bride and groom, they don't take a honeymoon. Their honeymoon is to stay in the household. And the honeymoon is a week-long party with your friends. Imagine the reception beginning after the ceremony and going for seven days. The food, the drinks, the music, the dancing, the laughter for seven days. And so when Jesus talks about the bridegroom and about fasting, often fasting is tied with mourning. And so there's a loss or there's a separation. Well, Jesus is saying, well, we're all together. There's no reason for fasting. And so there's this week-long celebration. Now, when that week-long ends and the bride and the groom, they take off, the party ends, then obviously then there's a little bit of sadness because the party's over. But weddings look a little bit different. The garment one, we can kind of get our head around a little bit more because I've heard and I've learned, don't ask me how, that certain items don't belong in the dryer. Anybody else learn that lesson yet? Like, like there's certain clothes that when they come out of the washing machine, you don't just gather them all up and throw them into the dryer. There are certain things that need to be pulled out, right? They cannot go in the dryer. Why? Because when they do, they shrink. And so Jesus is talking uh, about clothing or uh, linens and, and fabric that shrinks over time. So his story is pretty simple in that one where he says, you have a, you have a garment, you have a, a pair of jeans, you've got a shirt, you've got something. It's been through the wash, it's been through the dryer, it's shrunk to whatever shrinking is going to do for that particular garment. And when it does, it's done moving. Now, if you take a brand new piece of cloth that hasn't had the chance to shrink yet, and you sew it nice and tight around the hole, as that new piece begins to shrink up, because it hasn't had a chance to do that yet, it starts pulling on that stitching, and it pulls, and it tears, and it makes a hole that's even bigger. Okay, we can kind of get our head around that one. That one makes a little bit more sense to us. But the third one, for most of us, is going to be a complete foreign idea. Wineskins. What is that all about? Well, this is the way it would work. You'd create these large sacks of, of leathered uh, material, essentially. It's, it's an animal that's it's been tanned and it's been leathered up. And, and so you take that, you take that uh, material and you seal it tight. So you're going to put wine inside and you're going to seal it up tight. Now, I don't know much about the fermenting process. Some of you know way more about this than I do. But what I do know is that as wine is going to ferment, it releases gases. All right, so new wineskins are elastic. They, they, can, they can stretch and they can, they can pull, and, and, and so they will expand. So as the fermentation process happens and it expands, the, the, the wineskins will expand with the gases that are inside of it. But old wineskins have already been expanded, and they get old, they get brittle. So the old wine skins aren't as pliable. Not only they're not elastic, but they're not as pliable anymore. So now you take new wine that hasn't yet fermented, and you put it inside of an old wine skin, seal it up tight, and then the gases begin to build up from the fermentation process, and the wine skin explodes. It, it bursts open. Of course, destroying the wine skin and all of that wine that you've worked to create spills out and runs all over the ground. So wedding, garment, and wineskins. These are the things that Jesus talks about in his everyday life that maybe we do know, maybe we don't know, but now we understand just a little bit more. So those are the things that he uses, but what is he saying? What is the message that comes from this particular parable? Well, as Jesus is offering this, you need to remember this is early on in his ministry. He's just beginning all of his time. It, we're in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, we are after the, the Sermon on the Mount, and we're early in his ministry. People are still trying to figure him out. They're trying to figure out, how do I interact with this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? What is he all about? And so he talks uh, about how he is coming, and when he does, it, it's going to change the way you think about the Messiah. 
it changes your understanding uh, of who the Messiah is and how he's going to come and how we interact with him. He's offering new ideas. And these new ideas, they don't fit with the old ideas. Right? So this new idea, if you just try to take this new idea and apply it to an old idea, you're going to have ripping and tearing. So if you have this understanding of religion, this understanding of Messiah, and you take, you take Jesus and you just apply it to it, you're going to have tearing that's going to occur. Or if you have this, this old concept of who Jesus is and you pour him in, he's going to burst it wide open. His new idea doesn't fit the old paradigm. He's introducing a new idea, a new way of doing things. And ultimately, he's talking about himself coming. And as I thought about him coming, I couldn't help but think of the Lord's Prayer, which was just a few chapters prior in the Sermon on the Mount and, and, and in other Gospels as well. And there's a part of the Lord's Prayer when we pray it our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. This idea that, that, that we want the kingdom of God to come. In some of our literature uh, that, that kind of helps uh, unpack some of our doctrine and our theology, Martin Luther would write this about kind of understanding the your kingdom come language. He says this, that the kingdom of God truly does come of itself without our prayer. But in this part of the prayer, in this petition of the prayer, we pray that it may also come to us. What does it mean for the kingdom of God to come to us? And so as Jesus is entering into his ministry and as he's beginning and as he starts to lay out that he doesn't fit the ideas that you have of what it's like to live with the Messiah, a couple ideas came to mind, a couple of these old ideas. And they came to me a little bit out of the text looking and saying, this is a little bit of how this feels. So we're going to read the text, but we're going to do it in reverse. And I'm going to start with verse 17. And reminder, this, this is, this is the, old, the wine skins, right? So Jesus says, neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. And both are preserved. So the old idea that maybe some of us hold on to of the kingdom of God, of Jesus coming to us, is that I ask Jesus into my life. So there's a, there's a phrase that's uh, been used for many, many, many years, decades. And the phrase is, ask Jesus into my heart. There are parts of that phrase that I like. There are parts of that phrase that I really don't like. The evolution of that phrase is a little bit uh, unknown, but as I did a little bit of looking into it to try to understand where this came from, first of all, the idea of ask Jesus into my heart, you're not going to find it in the Bible. It's not a biblical phrase. It's not a biblical concept. It began there and has morphed over time. And so many believe that it's going to stem from Colossians chapter 2, where we are told that we received Christ Jesus as Lord. Past tense, we received Christ Jesus as Lord. And somewhere along the line that, that turned into that we receive Jesus or that we have received Jesus into our hearts. The heart thing, God talks a lot about an old heart, new heart. There's also the conversation or the language around, uh, around the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling within us and we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. I see where the language has come from. But over time, that has really taken on its own phrase. And somewhere, they think around the 1960s, 1970s, when children's ministries became, a, a, became more of a thing, more than just a Sunday school class, but it became more of a part of the church, the ask Jesus into your heart language became a popular way to help kids understand how you, how you have the sinner's prayer and the part of coming to Jesus. But you're not going to find it in the Bible. Ask Jesus into your heart is not a biblical phrase or a biblical concept. And that doesn't mean it's bad. If you use that phrase, if you've used it with your kids, I've used it. Like, There's parts of it that are okay. I think it leaves us a little bit lacking. And, and frankly, it, it leaves some unintended consequences. 
I think there are other languages that are better. I love Romans 10 where it talks about believe and confess. And so if a kid is asking, you can, you can go back to do you believe that Jesus did this? And, and that type of thing. Like, there's opportunities for just admission and confession, which is a little bit more in line with the biblical uh, phrasing. But when we talk about asking Jesus into our hearts, one of the unintended consequences is that it paints a picture that Jesus joins us on our journey. Right, like the way we receive that your kingdom come, the way that Jesus comes to us is that we have a path, we have a journey, we have a life, and Jesus comes in and joins us. He steps into uh, our patterns and our life rather than the understanding that we join him in his story, in his plan, in all that he is doing, we join him. He joins us. He comes into us. But that idea doesn't work. That's not how Jesus comes. As we think about the idea of wineskins bursting, we cannot contain all that God is doing and wants to do. It is not a matter of God joining us because what he has planned is so much bigger than us and what he is doing is so much bigger than us. We cannot contain him, but rather we join him. So we may have this idea that we have a life, we have a, a family, we have a career, we have a plan, and we're asking Jesus to join that career, that family, that plan. But that's an idea that doesn't work. That's an old wineskin that's not going to contain the new wine. So maybe it's not that he joins us. Maybe there's a way that the patchwork idea that Jesus talked about from the garment would work as well. Because the other way we see it isn't so much that he joins us, but maybe it gives us even more authority over ourselves and more uh, assumption of our own control over our life. And we just need Jesus to patch the few holes that are in our life. There are a lot uh, of those who claim Jesus and, and say that they love him and, and are following him that, that say that I have a plan and I've got a pretty good life. I've got a lot of it put together, but as I've got all these things put together, there's a few holes here and there, and Jesus has the answer for those particular parts, those small parts, those holes that are in my life. So, you know, I, I've got my life, but I, but I need a little bit more on purpose, and so I'm going to grab Jesus, and I'm going to use Jesus to patch the purpose part of life. I mean, I've got the rest of it. I don't, I don't need him for that. I'm just going to need him for this little part of my life. And so he'll be the patchwork part of that. Or maybe it's the morality side, right? Like, like I have some sort of a framework for how I'm going to behave, and so I'm going to use Jesus as my morality guide. I'm going to, I'm going to do the Sermon on the Mount stuff. I'm going to try to strive for the Ten Commandments stuff, and so I'm going to use Jesus as the patchwork part of that part of my life. Or maybe it's the comfort in hard times, so I'm going to use him for that moment. Or maybe I'm going to use him as the genie in the bottle, right? So if I just pray and I ask for something, Jesus will give it to me. Or maybe I need the vengeful God that's going to strike down my enemy. And so I have my life, I have everything that I'm doing, and I feel really good about it. I just need Jesus to plug a couple holes here and there. And so I use him as a patch. It allows me to stay in my comfortable jeans, and I can patch the holes, and I can keep on going. But that idea doesn't work either. That idea doesn't work either. And if you live that way and you see Jesus, the, your kingdom come, the Jesus coming to me as a patchwork to my life that I already have established, you're going to find that there's going to be a tearing and an exposing of even more holes because Jesus will not be part. He is all. He is all of life. We join him in all of this. And so if we use Jesus in the small ways, he ends up pulling away from us. And as he does, it stretches and it exposes even more of our life. We don't ask Jesus to join us in our plan. We don't use him as a patchwork 
to fill in the gaps and the voids in our life. What Jesus teaches us in this parable as he addresses the question of fasting is that your kingdom come looks different than we thought it did. Because your kingdom come means being ushered in in the most intimate of ways to the kingdom of God. Verse 15 talks about the wedding. It talks about the bridegroom and it paints the picture of the wedding. And the wedding theme in scripture is not new. This isn't the first time that the, the idea uh, of the bride and the groom uh, are, are a part of things. In fact, we're going to find this in the Old Testament. God uses the wedding paradigm, the, this, this idea of the bride and the groom and his relationship with his people throughout scripture from beginning to end. Listen to this in, in Hosea chapter 2. Uh, the prophet Hosea uh, married a, a woman, a prostitute woman, and, and he spent his, his life continuing to chase after this woman who continually leaves him. And, and Hosea is in a real life parable of, of God's people continuing to wander away from him to find other lovers, to find other gods. And Hosea lives this parable with this woman. And the wedding language comes out of Hosea chapter 2, and he says this, when God says, the day will come, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. I will make you my wife forever, showing your righteousness and justice, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you, and make you mine, and you will finally know me as Lord. God talks to his, his people as he is the groom, and they are the bride, and they will be one in, in an intimate way, in a relationship that is a beautiful, God-given one. See, God is the groom, his people are the bride. So as Jesus is saying this, as he's saying, when the bridegroom is with the disciples, they don't need to fast. He's saying, I am God. He's claiming divinity in that moment. And he says that I am God. And as the groom seeks after his bride on the wedding day, so God seeks after us to usher us into the kingdom. So Jesus uses this everyday language of a wedding that we can understand and that we do get to help us see that when Jesus says, I am the groom, that we can understand that we are the bride. That your kingdom come isn't simply Jesus coming into my life or Jesus patching the holes, but rather being ushered into the family in a beautiful, beautiful way. And as Jesus talks uh, about this, he paints that picture to help us see the beauty, the beauty of what it is to be in life with Jesus because there's great joy. I don't know how many of you guys have been to a great reception, a great wedding reception. I've been to a few that, that you look and you, you leave that saying, man, that was a great reception. I, I I'm not much of a wedding dancer kind of a guy, but my, but my kids are. And, and so I've been to the weddings when they were little and you just couldn't tear them off the dance floor because they were just their little selves just dancing and having a great time in their pretty fr frilly dresses and just loving it for all the hours of the dance. And you couldn't get them off even though they're going to be exhausted, tired the next day. And they're laughing and they're having fun and, and the food and all there is to drink. It was just a beautiful Fun evening. And as my kids have gotten older and, and we're going to weddings where their friends are also in the high school and the young college age and, and the dance floor takes on a whole new meaning. It's not about dancing around in your little frilly dress. Now it's out there having a blast with all of your friends. I've been to the wedding receptions and I know you have too where, man, this could go for another three hours and I wouldn't care because this is so much fun. The picture of the seven-day wedding reception uh, of the first century weddings helps us see that there is great joy in being with the Lord. These week-long wedding celebrations, they were, they were the opportunity for poor and simple families to go all out. 
and, and it was a once in a lifetime opportunity of, of rejoicing and, and just having a festivity that would go on and, and being treated like royalty and all the friends and the family coming and what is a normal mundane life, that moment is pure joy for all those days. There's great joy in being with Jesus. There's great joy in being in his presence. Not him filling voids in life, but rather us joining him in this great festivity. There is joy in being with the Lord. A gloomy Christian just really isn't possible because of the joy that we have as we walk with Christ. But at the same time he talks about this wedding, he also reminds us that there are struggles, right? So in the midst of, of this idea of the bridegroom being present and the celebration of all of those that are at the, uh, attending the party, he says there's a time in which the bridegroom will no longer be there, the groom will no longer be there. So he reminds us that there are difficult times. There, there's, there's difficulty that lies ahead. It's not all joy and beauty and happiness. Some want to sell a picture of Jesus that is completely, that is completely void of any struggle. That the Jesus life is an easy life. That the Jesus life is a wonderful prosperity life that will have, have unlimited funds and joy and happiness. But that's not the case. Hard times come. There are those moments of hard times. And in that, he presents the challenge. Can we live in the joy of the presence of Jesus and endure through and sustain through the struggles that also come? Or will we bail when it gets hard? Because both are there. One commentator said it this way, the Christian way brings its joy, but the Christian way also brings its blood, sweat, and tears, which cannot take the joy away, but which, nonetheless, must be faced. So Jesus says, are you ready for both? The Christian joy and the Christian cross. The joy and the cross. And there's something that happens as Jesus makes this statement. When he says the groom won't always be here, there's a bit of a veil that's removed. And we see Jesus. Because Jesus knows full well what that meant. Even early on in his ministry, as people are trying to figure him out, as people are still learning who he is, he is already signaling about the cross. And Jesus knows what it means when he says the groom will no longer be here. He knows what that means for him. He knows why he is here. He knows what is in front of him. And yet he did not sidestep the pain but he accepted the way that, Je that God had laid out for him. He knew the way of the cross for himself, and he continued on. The imagery of the wedding feast and joining Jesus, it, it, this joy-filled celebration. But even the joy-filled celebration that lasts for seven days ends at day seven, and day eight begins the normal mundane life again. But because Jesus endured the cross, because Jesus didn't sidestep the hurt and the pain that would come his way, we are invited into a joy that doesn't end, a joy that will never end. And so the storyteller today tells the story of things that don't fit, old things and, and new things and how the new things don't work with the old things. And he helps us understand 
your kingdom come means Jesus comes different than we thought. Comes to me different than I thought. He doesn't fit my predetermined life. He's not there to patch the holes. But rather he invites. He invites me into a joy-filled celebration life. That yes, we'll have its struggles. But he invites us in to the relationship with him. The storyteller today points us to himself. Your kingdom come to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Jesus, that you came and that you came in a different way. But God, I also confess that when you come in a different way than I expect or in a different way than I intend, that it's hard for me to accept that way. I, I would rather accept you on my terms than come to you on yours. So God, would you, Holy Spirit, enable me to come to you, to come into that great wedding feast, to dine and, and to be a part of this family. And would you give me the ability to sustain and the strength to sustain in the hard times and enjoy the joy-filled times? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and, and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. You simply click, and you can spend more time with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. Or you can visit triumphlbc.org events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would, would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.